Welcome, 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 everyone. Welcome to this edition of Crashes and Taxes. This is uh, the podcast that I have been prepping for probably for the last three years of my life. Um, this is the largest work. Um, it's not the largest work I've ever done professionally, but I think it's the largest work that I have ever done um, from this perspective. And it is um, a massive, massive, massive topic. And it is something that will uh, be revelational. Um, and I believe alarming. If it's not alarming to you, I, you, you're way light years beyond uh, the population of the world. And so today we are going to go through um, one of the most intricate and woven um, series of human events that has ever been globally coordinated. I am calling this presentation a global Etch-a-Sketch. You know, when you think of an Etch-a-Sketch, you think of um, the ability to, you know, use two nozzles and start from our opposite ends of this, you know, coming together and creating a structure. My disciplines, um, my professional background, obviously this podcast, and I'm, I'm so glad that I actually have the entire name of this podcast right here for right now. So you guys can see it challenging the status quo of crashes, taxes, politicians, and politicians, because we literally cover everything uh, related to finance. And that certainly is impacted by politicians and, you know, legal frameworks globally and in the United States. So this is going to be um, quite, quite interesting to get to and through this material today. This is gonna be a long um, episode. I'm just gonna tell you we're going to cover so much information. And I will also say that you will be at a huge disservice if you are just listening. I will do my absolute best to spell it out, but there are a, a lot of slides and I can't convey and verb verbiage and verbally what these slides portray if you were to actually look at this presentation. I know that we have uh, several mediums and channels that we are delivering this information on because the information is um, quite sensitive and you know could be uh, challenging for uh, some. So I am going to etch a sketch for you a global framework of the consolidation of factors that have really begun since the 1900s and bringing us to present day and where we are. And so let's go ahead and actually uh, get started. It's gonna be a, a great project and I'm hoping I'm gonna get through it without uh, and getting upset or, or crying or any, and anyway, get tearing up, you know, is my, is my thing. Um, the first thing I want to say is I'm telling you up front that this information is um, is quite um, difficult to comprehend and certainly difficult to accept. And so your natural psychological inclination, although this is not one of my disciplines, um, is that you will your mind will want to reject the information offhand. And I'm challenging you to open your mind so that you can see a paradigm shift at the end of our time together. I also want to, and I will give credit to other, you know, academics and a lot of um, professionals in the world, you know, as uh, a global uh, MBA from the London School of Economics, I have a very global perspective of business. As a lawyer, I'm able to do a lot of academic and legal research and go down rabbit holes and find information. And then I think as, a, you know, a financial expert and someone who understands markets and economics, I am able to try my best to consolidate information into presentable, synthesized format. Um, there are a lot of academic people that um, have helped me with this project and, and, and their work has definitely impacted and helped with this project. And I will definitely give them full credit as I would want full credit for all of the work um, that, that we do for free because we have passions about our professional disciplines and, and just about our country, right? And our constitution, I am a freedom lover. 
So we're going to just move on now. So again, as I was just saying, I'm going to lay out some foundational global principles of where we have come since the 1900s and specifically how it has impacted everything and will, and more importantly, will impact everything that we know in life. Um, and, and, and we are there. We are at the precipice. The fact that this information is even now being disseminated, being, con, you know, synthesized and disseminated means that we are at the precipice because I don't think that this podcast would even be possible even just. In fact, I know it wouldn't be because I will explain to you how this all came to be. All right. So let's start with the very beginning um, hypothesis. Uh I'm trying to lay a framework for you guys that you guys can understand why what has happened has actually happened. And so I'm going to begin to challenge your paradigm a little bit by letting you know that there are legitimate people uh, that care about this planet and care about this earth. And they truly believe that um, that the overpopulation of the earth is a, a systemic and basically uh, extinction level problem. In other words, if we don't get under control our overpopulation, we will run out of natural resources for the rest of everybody else. And you could see sort of uh, a human extinction uh, happen. And, and, and obviously that's the extreme, extreme example. But I just wanted to give you a couple of examples here. You can see here in April of 2009 in Science Daily, we had uh, a paper about the worst environmental problem, overpopulation. Here's a sustainability for all global pop when the global population hit 8 billion and they talk about the causes and the consequences of overpopulation. So I want you to start in your mind seeing a framework that there is a group of people um, that have a global concern that we must immediately and imminently deal with human overpopulation, that it is just too much for the Earth's natural resources and that we could look at uh, potentially extinction level events. Here is another example, effects of human overpopulation and specifically talking about fresh water going, ex species becoming extinct and uh, literally, you know, us losing our life expectancy because the Earth won't be able to sustain us. So that brings me to, in that framework, what we're going to actually go through today. And this is going to be um, a framework, an etch-a-sketch of the global arc of power that is multidisciplinary. In fact, it is now so interconnected and intertwined that it, it can't exist outside of its interconnectedness. And so specifically, we are looking at three areas and three disciplines. And the first one is something I talk about incessantly on this podcast. It is my passion and my forte, and that is the global economy macroeconomics, economics, microeconomics, how to make money in the, in the world, and certainly how to how to uh, help investors. This is, you know, uh, done really. And uh, now where we are at this present time, we're really at the point of central banks. And that, of course, the head, the top central bank of all central banks is the Bank of International Settlements. And in the United States, of course, so that's a global entity in the United States, of course, it is the Federal Reserve, which was a private corporation chartered in 1913 by the Federal Reserve Act uh, that Congress passed. So that is the first arc of global interconnected power uh, that we are going to be quickly going through because that is something that you guys know I have been laying out for you multiple ways. But we will rec we will go through that because I have a feeling a lot of people are going to forward this uh, podcast to friends and family who have never watched Crashes and Taxes before, and they won't have any idea what I'm talking about. So we do have to cover that because it is uh, an essential framework of the Etch-a-Sketch. And then we're going to go into global security, military and defense mechanisms that uh, specifically have been framed Etch-a-Sketch a certain way. And then we will move forward into global health. And um, that, of course, at the international level is the World Health Organization uh, in conjunction with the United Nations. And then, of course, in America, that is the Department of Health and Human Services. So what I'm trying to, to present to you is that these three disciplinary areas have intersected and merged actually, uh, into one group of global uh, etch-a-sketched framework 
of what the future holds for the world. That seems really hard to believe, but there it, it is impossible to have the level of global coordination that has happened, that we have witnessed now for the first time without uh, the interconnectedness of these multidisciplines. So let's keep going. So specifically, we are going to cover what is this global organization, um, and it is a consortium, obviously, of uh, multiple groups, a lot of NGOs, a lot of uh, actual governments, uh, you know, and, and uh, a lot of governing bodies that are, that are not really elected, like the UN, the World Economic Forum, the, these public-private partnerships. So let's talk about global organizations, and we're going to talk economics first, which obviously involves in this framework, the creation of money, the distribution of wealth and finance and financial control. Then we're going to look at military and the development of irregular warfare off the battlefield and into every part of global civilization. And finally, we're going to look at healthcare specifically and how it's been globally coordinated and centralized uh, with planning and care protocols that are designed to further the unified global goals. Now, I want to explain that in America, these things um, are perfectly explainable. Um, sort of, <laughs> meaning that in a silo, you can see how all of these things that I'm going to reveal and go through with you have actually occurred and have actually happened. But when you step back and you frame it as an Etch-a-Sketch and you put it all together, you realize that you have um, truly, probably an unstoppable human um, web that it, it would be extremely difficult without help from God to really um, deal with. And so I, I don't want anyone to think that I am discussing um, the potential nefarious nature of some elite group of people at the very top that have sort of coordinated all of this. Uh, I'm not going to that sort of extreme you know, view. You can think whatever you want. I am always going to be based in facts and data. And in fact, I think for this presentation, we have over 50 uh, source reference documents that will be delivered with this presentation so that you guys can see all of the information that we will cover. So what, whether it was been, you know, uh, created by this global group of elite people or not, I do not care. Uh, I want to show you where we are now based on every Thing that's happened. And so just from the United States perspective, I'll just give you a framework uh, in two areas that you can really start to see how this has been enabled. The American people accepted this and did not push back as we went. And now we're just so far down this rabbit hole. And so specifically, I'm going to talk to you about, uh, obviously, September 11th of 2001, 9-11. And for America, that was the beginning of what we call the global war on terror. And we accepted a lot of new legislative um, powers and statutes and a lot of new um, you know, actual power by both the president um, and, and a lot of other groups, which we're going to lay out, because we felt like we were being threatened globally and we needed additional security measures and protections. And a lot of people, and we've seen that over and over and over, and Ben Franklin actually warned about it, you know, is and, and, and a lot of uh, patriots, uh, founding fathers warned about this, that people have a natural inclination that will give up freedom and give up liberty if they feel they need to be protected by their government. And that is exactly what happened after 9-11, understandably so. The next thing that I would say is that uh, we started to see um, a new kind of uh, birth of uh, global disease or virus or whatever. And in 2003, which was very shortly after 9-11, we got uh, SARS. And so that was the beginning of the um, the movement of uh, legislation and, and additional powers into the where the uh, arena of healthcare, and that has since uh, just blown up completely. And so, what we're really now discussing today, in a nutshell, is the uh, the globalization and the militarization of uh, finance. Um, economics, militaries, and healthcare together. So it is a consortium of control 
in an Etch-a-Sketch framework that basically has now put us into a situation where we have never been with such diminished rights ever, ever in the history of mankind. And uh, that is what I'm going to lay out for you today. So let's continue. And this is exactly what I'm talking about. Uh, the global economy actually merges into healthcare law. The financial economy actually merges into healthcare law. And um, so it's it's a lot of inf information. Um, I'm giving you just a quick example here. I'm not going to really go through Basel III, um, but I want to let you know that Basel III, which are the regulations for the Bank of International Settlements that they send out to all central bankers on how and what tier assets, tier one, tier two, tier three. And this is just a, the latest example that Basel III um, was uh, updated and went into effect in on June 28, 2021, where gold moved. And so this is, we're talking about central banks holding gold reserves and that those reserves used to be held as a tier three asset and wouldn't be dollar for dollar countable. They were discounted and uh, they were moved to tier one assets where they were dollar for dollar countable. And that was because uh, Basel III really uh, beefed up the liquidity requirements um, after we had, you know, quite a, a lot of problems in 2008 and 2009, um, a lot of the Dodd-Frank, all these things that happened, um, the Bank of International Settlements was changing Basel III. And so you can see that there are frameworks globally that affect us. So let's talk specifically now, and we're going to go through the financial topics. This is more of a recap for people that don't watch Crashes and Taxes. If you've never watched crashes and taxes. I wanted to make sure I go through this so that you can understand what is happening on the global banking front and macroeconomics um, so that you can understand how that is then transitioning into this uh, framework of control that we're talking about. And so you can see here that um, I've got this central bank digital currency and central bank digital currency basically is the exact opposite of what we call decentralized finance or DeFi for short. DeFi for short was really the invention of currencies on the blockchain, uh, a distributed ledger that was not able to be um, basically changed. It was audit proof, if you will. And unless you had a fork, which I won't go into because that's really beyond the scope, but uh, with the very rare exceptions, you, you have, you know, just an absolute complete uh, digital blockchain audit trail. And that is decentralized finance. That really came out and got people used to kind of the idea of currency on the blockchain. But central banks absolutely hate decentralized finance. And the reason they hate it is because they have no control over it. And they want central banks, central planning, want central control. They want to have digital currency, but they want it to be direct digital currency. And uh, Catherine Austin Fitz has done an incredible job with Solari report um, on this going direct reset, talking specifically about the elimination of uh, commercial deposits and consumer deposits at third party commercial banks, and that we will all have a direct account directly in the United States with the Federal Reserve. And uh, that is what that is. Now, you can see here that I'm mentioning very briefly uh, the World Economic Forum and the United Nations. In March of 2022, almost a year ago, they signed a memorandum of understanding. And that memorandum of understanding uh, advanced what they have published. And you can look this information up um, for Agenda 2030. Agenda 2030 is the World Economic Forum, which is a, a non-governmental organization, an NGO, and their big thing um, under the direction of the founder, Klaus Schwab, is that they want the public-private partnership. And so they rely on private corporations doing things that public entities that have, are limited by citizens' protections and laws could not do. So they set out a framework of how can we get this done? We can't do it here, but we can marry in the, the private partnership and we will get it done this way. The perfect example in the United States of this type of thing is the Twitter file releases that have happened since Elon Musk took over Twitter officially, where it, we have since found out that there was actual direct communication at multiple levels of local, state, and uh, federal government agencies communicating uh, with Twitter directly on what 
what information should not be remain on the platform and be publicized and what information should. And then also uh, taking down information, which we'll get to later about um, about topics that they, they just didn't want. They wanted to control the public conversation. And we, there's a legal reason that that happened that we are going to go through. So the, the point of this is that um, I think that they had expected these things to sort of take until 2030 and the rollout deadline would be 2030. But because of uh, the events of 2022 and the acceleration of the financial events of 2022, and specifically what we're talking about is the uh, Russia invading Ukraine and the West retaliating by kicking Russia out of the SWIFT international payment system. That alone in February of last year and then March by the kickout of last year, uh, actually February, um, really started the, uh, the acceleration, if you will, of the de-dollarization of the world. China had already done a substantial amount of work on the infrastructure of their belt and road on along the OPEC nations. OPEC plus includes Russia. And so there was already a lot of coordination along this belt and road infrastructure and other things. But once uh, they, they moved Russia out of SWIFT um, and the BRICS nations sort of have coalesced, and now we see a lot of other nations joining or moving towards that consortium and nations that are, are quite problematic. And so um, what specifically am I talking about? Um, Saudi Arabia, which for those of you who have not listened to this podcast, again, um, we basically had a securitized agreement with Saudi Arabia um, that was entered into and negotiated between the king of Saudi Arabia and Henry Kissinger in 1974, February. And since that time, we had an agreement where we would be their uh, military and they would then basically keep the OPEC nations and OPEC plus Russia agreed to just transact crude sales in U.S. dollars. That basically gave us a quasi uh, black gold oil uh, standard for the backing of the U.S. dollar as not, you know, in any way um, to be it was it had backing of some kind. When we came off the gold standard in 71, we had inflation, we had problems. We needed an intrinsic hard asset to continue to back the, the validity of the U.S. dollar. And so that we entered into the, the really the uh, petrodollar arrangement with Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia announced in January of this year, 2023, in Davos, Switzerland, that they are open to transacting the sale of crude oil outside of the U.S. dollar. So we are looking at the de-dollarization of the world. We are looking at the de-dollarization of the petrodollar, the loss of the petrodollar, and of course, then the end of dollar hegemony. So um, this is a Forbes article, and I want to just point out some dates to you here. You can see April of 2022, central bank digital currencies are about are about control. They should be stopped. I've explained multiple times. These are really the end of currency as we know it and the beginning of what we would call a voucher system that is can completely controllable by the government. Um, here is a market watch opinion from June of 2020. So this is a little bit older. And this basically sent, says central bank digital currencies won't would increase the government's grip on money with few benefits for the rest of us. So basically they're talking about small incremental differences in transaction speed. If you have Venmo, Zelle, Cash App, you you know uh, all of these, these things about faster payment processing is ridiculous. It's just like saying we need 5G to be faster. Like you won't even humanly notice the speed differential. Uh, there are other reasons for these things that are beyond just convenience for uh, humans. Here is the conversation, which is an academic uh, publication. This is August of last year. Um, central bank digital currencies could mean the end of democracy. And that might sound hyperbolic to you, but what a central bank digital currency means is that they 100% see everything that you earn, they 100% see everything that you spend, and they can also turn off your access. So what the equivalent of the Supreme Court of Canada just recently ruled from the trucker uh, protest that was happening at the beginning of uh, last year in Canada, and the government actually shut down bank accounts, and this, their version of the Supreme Court just ruled that that was perfectly within their right. So if you can imagine that you know you have their bank accounts and you have to go out and get everyone's license plate, follow who they are, get their bank account, shut it down, if you have a central bank digital currency with digital IDs, which are a requirement, a prerequisite 
what is it, for a central bank digital currency, we all must have a digital ID, uh, then you understand that uh, you are locked into a controlled grid of finance and you won't be able to do anything without permission. And this is where we start to bring in the other disciplines and the other acts that are consolidated into this, uh, you know, really digital jail, if you will. And then here we have a Carnegie Endowment for International Peace article from January of 2020 paper, basically. And it's uh, talking about multipolarity in practice. And this was before Russia invaded Ukraine, obviously, by two years. And you can see that we're talking about Russia's engagement with regional institutions. So Russia and, and China have been working towards uh, an de-dollarized alternative for, I would say, at least uh, probably probably close to 20 years um, then we have Modern Diplomacy, and this was published just at the end of last year in December of 2022, and this is a BRICS reserve currency for the those of you that don't know what BRICS is, BRICS is the consortium of uh, Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa. We now have many other nations since the uh, kicking out of Russia from the SWIFT West payment system uh, that are moving towards BRICS. And there's so many, I'm not going to even list them. There's just too much information to cover. Here's another uh, article from 2022, BRICS role in the global systemic transition to multipolarity. In other words, no longer having dollar hegemony and one global reserve currency. No other countries are saying enough of this, especially after the United States really was legitimately considered to have weaponized the dollar last year against Russia, uh, much to our not ex extreme success because Russia is very domestically uh, focused on their own production, their own energy. So the importing or the withholding of importing, which actually isn't even working anyways because of their alternative uh, system, is just not really helpful. And and you can see here, this is a July 2022 paper uh, from Global Research on uh, Center for Research on Globalization. And this is a, just a, a non, um, nonprofit organization. Geopolitics, Global Economy and Multipolarity BRICS Plus provides alternatives which nullify sanctions. This is exactly what I'm talking about. The West sanctioned Russia and to the extent that Russia is really autonomous and has built alternative payment systems, they were largely not impacted from the sanctions of the West. And so then this brings me to, uh, this is the foreign policy um, essay of the rise and fall and rise and fall of the U.S. financial empire. The dollar is dead. Long live the dollar. This is a January of 2021, um, you know, analysis from foreign policy. So that was pretty interesting. You can see American affairs here, the end of dollar hegemony. hegemony. I can never say that word correctly. I like to say hegemony, but it's hegemony. Um, and then the U.S. dollar's hegemony is looking fragile. This is in The Guardian from also 2021, April. So I want you to understand here's another world dollar hegemony is ending and that may be a good thing. And this is an article from just November of 2022. And so I want to conclude this economic section by just framing it up for you. What we have is a uh, global system that overstimulated economic stimulus post-coronavirus economic shutdown. We voluntarily globally, this happened globally, by the way, so there's the coordination for you. We voluntarily globally shut down many, uh, just we shut down, we went into quarantine and um, a lot of uh, implications from that. We weren't in quarantine ne nearly as long as I think they originally expected, but we were in quarantine and what that meant was that um, we we had to stimulate. And so we stimulated to the tune of about $30 trillion, obviously in local currencies outside the U.S., uh, locally. And that is just, it was too much to absorb. So that set off inflation. And then you have the central banks raising interest rates. And then you see a really big consorted effort. Um, I was in the London, actually in the UK um, in 2021, when they announced they were going to be going to uh, a central bank digital currency. Um, China within 10 days of uh, you know that announcement, China has announced a digital Wuhan uh, back in 2021 that would be coming live. That they had already been working on it, but that they were pushing it to live very soon. And then, of course, the U.S. dollar, the Fed now platform, the digital dollar is to be operational. You can look these things up directly from um, from just the Federal Reserve's uh, website and all about the Fed now digital dollar, which is supposed to be operational. It's in beta testing right now with several banks and Mastercard, and it is to be operational. 
final by May um, of July uh, through July of this year. And so that is the sort of push globally to move us economically to be controllable by central banks. And it's a specifically a problem for the United States because we have enjoyed being the world's reserve currency. What that means is we have basically lived off of about double our tax collection. Whatever we collect in taxes, we can spend about another double that from what we're selling out to the public. So we're only collecting about half of what we're actually spending in taxes. The rest we're selling our U.S. paper to the rest of the world that needed to buy them in order to buy OPEC plus uh, crude oil and U.S. dollars. If that changes, those those purchases no longer need to happen and you will see uh, impact immediately on the dollar. So the end of the petrodollar, the end of hegemony, the beginning of multipolarity and two world world reserves uh, systems is really the financial grid. And they're wanting to push us into central control direct with them because uh, things are, are going to get a little bit ugly economically. So that is the Bank of International Settlement, which is the Central Bank of Central Bankers and the Federal Reserve. Now we're going to go into um, sort of the new areas that are going to be revelational for our crashes and taxes audience um, that we have not covered before. And this is a lot of people could say, you know, Rebecca, um, this is so outside of your wheelhouse. Yeah, I am a lawyer. I do a lot of legal research. I, I am an academic. Uh, so there's nothing that I can't research and put together and understand, but this is not, you should all understand, this is not outside of the discipline of finance. Uh, this is financial. All of this is financial. This is uh, about the ability to have the economic resource to control outcomes and circumstances of human populations. So it is 100% financial. It is all now interrelated and interconnected. And so that is what we will be going through. So what, what we are talking about is the public monetization and the militarization of healthcare that has really occurred post 9-11. And to continue our Etch-a-Sketch framework, we're going to break this down into two areas, uh, domestic United States laws uh, specifically, and then we're going to look at the global framework that is also guiding the U.S. laws. And, and really, I would say at this point, um, beginning to control U.S. law. So we'll start with domestic. This is a really big uh, slide. I'm going to actually take myself off so that you guys can completely see these slides and I will come back on with you as soon as I can. Um, so the first thing I wanna talk about is um, the, the time frame here. And this is going, uh, I'm gonna walk through this and it's going to take a little bit of time. Uh, but this is really the piece that that we are are not understanding and that I'm I'm highlighting. And I, I will just want to say um, that um, Catherine Watt, who really is um, a legal researcher, an author, she has uh, a Substack, um, Bailiwick News. She has been a phenomenal academic resource in this arena. And I'm certainly not in any way trying to emulate her work. I'm trying to bring it into more of a direct. Uh, light directly uh, connecting these dots for for you guys and actually showing you the actual laws, which I think um, is quite alarming. And, and you will see that the the laws themselves are quite alarming. So the first thing I want to go through is this 1944 uh, Public uh, Health Service Act, the Public Health Services Act, which really set up public health as a service as part of the military. And so that was really early, early on. And I mean, it's the same year as Bretton Woods, but basically this was the beginning framework of public health and it being an actual, um, you know, entity uh, and group. And then in 1969, um, we had the Chemical and Biological Warfare Program, and we will look at that. But that is um, 50 USC Chapter 32, and specifically the Chemical and Biological uh, Warfare Program really began sort of what people are calling a false justification or a false um, a false dichotomy that. Um, we needed to set up or have programs uh, related to uh, sea 
CBRN, which stands for chemical, biological, radiological, and nuclear elements. Um, and, and that classifying and labeling those, those developments of those elements was defensive. It was for defensive purposes. It was prophylactic or it was protective. So we started this framework in 1969 in, a, in healthcare that basically said, we need to implement this CB are in a program um, because we need to protect ourselves in case anybody else does. And, and that is, you know, on its face, ridiculous. You're going to develop uh, advanced, um, you know, chemical, biological, radiological, or nuclear weapons because somebody else is also going to do it. But all of these, uh, these types of things are uh, active, they're aggressive, they're not retaliatory, they're not defensive, they're, they're actually, um, you know, aggressive, they're in the affirmative. So that just set up a framework that's a little bit false. In 1983, we had a Public Health Services Act amendment that really created for the first time PHEs, or public health emergencies. It also created a public health emergency fund that was publicly funded that could be, uh, you know, at the time was only $30 million. So that's, you know, not a lot more. And that was in 1983. But basically, it was the ability of the government to have a fund that could be disseminated quickly to deal and target uh, public health emergencies. Nothing uh, unusual or nefarious. Like I said, all these things can be rationalized individually. And it's only when you put the Etch-a-Sketch framework together that you can see, whoa, wait a minute, what has happened here? In 1986, this is probably one of the most seminal uh, pieces of healthcare legislation that really has happened in the United States. And that was the introduction of the uh, national vaccine program, uh, you know, basically saying we want these kids to have these vaccines on these time frames. That was the really beginning of that. It also um, was the beginning of the National Childhood Vaccine Injury Act, which created the National Vaccine Compensation Program. So basically, people don't understand, even to this day, even as much work as Robert Kennedy has done on this with his Children's Defense Alliance, um, that basically um, vaccine manufacturers were um, avoid li liability um, from 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 developing these types of protocols that was requested by you know health services was not going to happen because you just had manufacturers that were too afraid of whatever potential liability could come and so they they weren't going to do that and obviously you can't have a healthcare system where no private entity will create any kind of therapeutics because they're afraid of liability if it's a, a new therapeutic so we got this concept of well we have have to shield them from liability because otherwise they won't create it. It won't be commercially viable. And that framework is very important uh, um, for what has since happened uh, post-2020. So we'll come back to that. But it was a really big framework. And it is something that, it, you know, there's so much literature on it. And, and still people just don't understand it. Then I have these three uh, acts together, 97, 97, so the National Defense Authorization Act for 98, the Food and Drug Administration's Modernization Act, and the 1998 Omnibus uh, Consolidated and Emergency Supplement Appropriations Act. And all of these things really started to expand access. Uh, and again, you could just do podcasts on just these acts, but I, I just want to give you the highest level possible where you can see the framework and finally get what is going on here. So... Really, um, in, in 97, 98, you had um, some court cases that were going on between um, untested anthrax, um, you know, interventions that were being used to help protect the military and deployments where they thought that this would be a, a biological agent that would be used. And there were some cases that were brought to the courts about, you know, you can't do this to military personnel. They have to have you know, all of these rights and protections and all of that. And so really the government in these three acts took away the right to uh, use these unapproved products directly on the military, but they expanded the, that ability to be able to be used on the human population overall. I know that's unbelievable, but I will show you the actual laws directly. So you will be able to see um, exactly what happened. The other thing they did is they took the stockpile of uh, weapons in the CBRN category, again, chemical, um, biological, radiological, and nuclear. They took those stockpiles and they relocated from the Defense Department to Health and Human Services, and they renamed them you know, pharmaceutical stockpiles for emergencies. All makes sense.
things, but you start to kind of push the PCs things together and say, wait a minute, um, we've just moved sort of weaponized military use and, you know, items into healthcare, uh, you know, that the health and human services, which really just controls healthcare for the United States citizenry has nothing to do with militarization. So it's a little, it's a little alarming. And then you have the 2000 Public Health Threats Emergencies Act. And this really set up what the, the beginning of uh, MCM. And this becomes really huge, this medical countermeasures. Uh, this is a, a legally defined term of art, medically um, medical countermeasures. And when you're dealing with medical countermeasures, you have new frames of legal protections or lack of legal protections because these are countermeasures. So we'll go uh, through that. In 2001, you have the um, basically the authorization for use of military force under uh, Bush, and this was the AUMF. And this really was the beginning of what we know to be the global war on terror. So uh, really, this sort of set um, the, the world potentially as a potential enemy combatant and that, you know, you, you would have different enemy combatants. And there's an actual famous United States Supreme Court case that we'll discuss when we go through that. Um, in 2002, you have the um, Public Health Security and Bioterrorism Preparedness and Response Act. And this really set up sort of like a Fannie Mae and a Freddie Mac, a consortium of a public-private enterprise that dealt with medical uh, countermeasures uh, to deal with public health and safety. You have the 2002 Homeland Security Act which created the Department of Homeland Security and then the T Transportation Safety um, Administration as a division of the DHS. So that sort of set up like these perpetual TSA checkpoints and kind of put us in almost, you know, a perpetual state of, of militarization, if you will, of, you know, being living in, in, in America. And so let's go through some of these things that I really want to uh, pull out for you. So this is uh, USC, uh, uh, 50 USC chapter 32. This is that 1969 chemical and biological warfare program. And I want to pull out here for you um, this 1520A, which is the restrictions on use of human subjects for testing of chemical and biological agents. So remember when I said in 1997 and, 90, and through 98, there were some cases and they really, through those three laws, pulled back the ability to you know, use untested medical inter intervention and protocols on military, and they expanded that to all humanity. So all Americans, all humans, you know, period. And so here's the restrictions of using human subjects for testing on chemical or biological agents, and I want you to see this, it says the Secretary of Defense may conduct directly or by contact any test or experiment involving the use of a chemical agent or biological agent on a civilian population or any other testing of a chemical agent or biological agent on human subjects, except, in part B as exceptions, subject to C, D, and E, the, prohib the set prohibition in subsection A, which means that the Secretary of Defense may not conduct these experiments of chemical or biological agents on civilian populations um, or human subjects. They may not conduct that um, unless uh, it is carried out, unless that test is being carried out for the following purposes. Number one, any peaceful purpose that is related to a medical, therapeutic, pharmaceutical, agricultural, industrial, or research activity. Any purpose that is directly related to the protection against toxic chemicals, biological weapons, and agents, any law enforcement purposes, including any purposes related to riot control. So what they're saying is you actually can test uh, chemical and biological weapon or agents <clears throat> on a civilian population if you're doing it for a peaceful purpose that is related to a medical activity. So post-2020 coronavirus, we absolutely have that situation where we have a new global pandemic for the first time, and we are going to have the federal government under the Secretary of Defense, the Department of Defense, able to actually test chemical and biological agents on a human civilian population because it is for the peaceful medical purpose um, related to disseminating that. You could also look at even number two that is directly related to protection against toxic chemicals or biological weapons or agents. You know, we don't even truly know what this actually is or was to this day. That will be coming 
ouch, when I tell you that will be coming out, it will be coming out. So you will see that even two could actually apply. And then, you know, three is not really applicable. So it start when you start to see the actual law and writing on paper, you, you start to realize, wow, wow, and wow. So here is the introduction, um, really, of the EUA, the Emergency Use Authorization. And this was, in fact, the actual impetus for me as a lawyer. I'm going to just uh, share it, come back to you guys for a minute. This was the actual impetus for me as a lawyer to go down this rabbit hole. <clears throat> because <clears throat> I understood that an EUA authorization had two specific parameters that needed to be met in order to, to be uh, legally affected. The first thing was that there could be no alternative. So if you, uh, if you approve a medical protocol through an EUA authorization, that can only legally happen if there's no other medical protocol intervention. So when we early on saw um, that a lot of doctors were coming out and talking about alternative early intervention treatment and therapies for specifically coronavirus, and you guys remember the Lancet had a report um, about the ineffectiveness of um, hydroxychloroquine, ivermectin, sensory tracted, um, but many doctors came out and said, hey, listen, between, um, you know, early intervention with some kind of bronchial steroid, um, hydroxychloroquine, something like that, or um, ivermectin, which is uh, interferes with the ability of the virus to actually attach uh, to the receptors. Um, you know, they, they had to not have those therapeutics take um, uh, be considered a viable medical protocol intervention for coronavirus. Otherwise, if that had not happened, you would never have an EUA authorization approved because there would be alternatives and you would not need to go to the extreme of an emergency use. So that tells you something right there. That tells you that an emergency use authorization is a very, very, very low bar. And it makes sense. Again, all of these things make logical sense. You need to have uh, the ability in a legal framework to to introduce a potential uh, fix, cure, medical cure that, you know, in an emergency situation that won't allow for the standard uh, six to 10 years of protocol testing, development, retesting, re, you know, you just don't have that framework of time. So you have to fast track everything and because you have to fast track everything. Of course, you're not going to go through traditional medical testing and protocols that are longitudinal and years in nature. And so EUA, makes sense, but specifically with coronavirus, what you saw, and this has since been uh, completely validated in writing and substantiated, and I could never add all that into this presentation, but you can go out and look at the Twitter files and specifically look at, and even congressional hearings uh, since the beginning of this year have shown that um, they absolutely censored some of the largest, most well reputable uh, doctors from Harvard, Stanford, um, Talking about alternative and uh, early uh, therapeutical inter interventions and 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 saying no 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 and that really set up the ability for uh, whatever therapeutic they were going to come up with eventually to get an emergency use authorization. So that being said, I, I have these up here because I want you guys to actually see what they are. So I'm going to just uh, quickly take myself off again because I need you guys to be able to see this whole screen. So this is uh, 21 U.S. Code uh, Section 360 BBB-3, Authorization for Medical Products for Use in Emergencies. And basically what you can see is that notwithstanding any provision of this chapter in Section 351 of Public Health Services Act, which we already talked about, the Secretary may author introduction of into interstate commerce during the effective period of a declaration under subsection B, a drug device or biological product intended for use in actual or potential emergency as an emergency use. The authorization under this paragraph one may authorize emergency use product that A, is not approved, licensed, or cleared for commercial distribution under traditional protocols of health services. So what this is saying is when we have an EUA, we do not have time for those traditional protocols and we can bypass those and go straight for the ability to uh, have this emergency intervention. Again, makes complete sense. Um, <clears throat> going back now through the list, and I want to specifically uh, talk about the um, authorization for use of military force that came about in 2021. This is a Brown University Watson Institute for International and Public Affairs 
um, analysis that was done in December of 2021, and you can see that it's showing you all of the military interventions that have been authorized through this AUF military force. And this uh, global war on terror authorization of military force also ended up in a famous Supreme Court case from 2004, Hamdi versus Rumsfeld, um, which was the Secretary of Defense at the time, um, Donald Rumsfeld. And basically, Hamdi was a U.S. citizen that had been detained as an unlawful enemy combatant, and he challenged the legality of his detention. Uh, the Supreme Court actually rejected his argument that the president lacked authority to detain citizen and enemy combatants, holding that Congress's enactment of the 2001 Authorization for Military Force authorized the president to do so. The court, though, did agree with Hamdi that due process is entitled a U.S. citizen who was detained in the United States as an enemy combatant to a meaningful opportunity to challenge his designation as an enemy combatant before a neutral decision maker. In other words, he had a procedural due process right to, um, to challenge his classification as an enemy combatant. But otherwise, uh, outside of that, if he is an enemy combatant, he absolutely uh, was legally detained. So this is where you can start to see kind of what happened around 9-11 and the, uh, the implications that, that came. I just want to digress for a moment because I realized I didn't ex exactly explain something. So when the EUA, this is the this was the nexus of how all of this, uh, me going down this rabbit hole for the last uh, really 18 months hard, but I would say really since March of 2020 uh, came about because I, I started having a problem once the therapeutics were being developed uh, for EUA authorization related to uh, the 2020 pandemic. Um, because we started getting the word mandates associated with these, these therapeutics. And the problem that, that I saw immediately as a lawyer is that mandates were not possible because when you have, uh, an EUA authorization, because the testing protocols have been bypassed, it requires legally that the human subject, the person that's receiving that medical uh, intervention, uh, give informed consent. The legal definition of informed consent is that a, a person has been fully explained the risks of the therapeutic and they waive, acknowledge, and then waive all of their legal rights on regarding any repercussions up to and including death. So if you actually read the informed consent waiver um, that you would have to sign for an EUA product, you will see that you actually are, it states right there that the protocols have been bypassed and that you acknowledge that there are risks that they are, that are unknown at this time. It's almost like an experiment. And it says that you are waiving your right your rights for any kind of compensation related to damages up to and including death. So I, as a lawyer, started really gra grappling with the fact in 2021 that we were looking at EUAs that were being paired with mandates, which is legally not obtainable. You cannot force someone to take an EUA that requires them to waive all of their rights even over their death. That is not legally reconcilable. So something else was going on. There was something else that was allowing that legal construct to happen. And that is the impetus for me going down for the last, uh, since March of 2020, into what is going on because healthcare obviously is not my area at all. Um, and so we, we have this. And so we're going to continue now with the uh, healthcare framework. So you guys can understand like literally, um, <laughs> you know, why I, I was, um, I was having such a hard time with reconciling how everything was going. So let's just talk here about uh, additional U.S. healthcare framework. So we have in 2004 the Project BioShield Act, and this again is really where, and I will read this over here, but you can really see where we got the CBRN products uh, for civilian use. Again, chemical, biological, radiological, and, and nuclear products for civilian use. We have the 2005 PrEP Act. The 2010 Affordable Care Act, which introduced um, the IDC-10 um, codes, which we will talk about, we will come back to that one on the global section, even though that was what we call Obamacare and that was a domestic law. We will come back to those when we get to the global section of healthcare. And then we have the 2015 Other Transactions Authority, which is uh, denoted legally in 10 USC 4022, the Department of Defense Prototypes 
And then we're going to talk about, um, again, the, the nexus of how this all came to be. And then finally, we're going to talk about 2018 Defense Production Act and a federal regulation that was promulgated um, by the executive branch related to that 2018 Defense Production Act. So let's talk about this 2004 Project BioShield Act. And you can see right here on the screen, the Project BioShield Act was an act passed under the United States Congress in 2004 calling for basically a $5 billion purchasing uh, requisition for um you know, medical protocols that would be used in the event of a bioterrorist attack. It was a 10 year program to acquire medical countermeasures. There's that MCM medical countermeasures to biological, chemical, radiological and nuclear agents for civilian use. That's directly from Wikipedia. And um, so that lets you know that this is sort of how they have moved the CBRN to civilian use. And again, all of these things make sense, right? They were on the heels of 9-11 and then the heels of 2003 SARS, which was sort of a global, you know, beginning. Now we're going to go to the PREP Act here. And the PREP Act is um, the Public Readiness and Emergency Preparedness Act, PREP. PREP Act is the existing declaration. Um, we're going to skip that. Let's talk about this. The Public Readiness and Emergency Preparedness Act, PREP Act, authorizes the Secretary of the Department of Health and Human Services, so that's the Secretary of HSS, to issue a PREP Act declaration. The declaration provides immunity from all liability except for willful misconduct for claims of loss arising out of relating to or resulting from administration or use of countermeasures to disease threats and conditions determined by the secretary to constitute a present or credible risk of a future public health emergency and the entities and individuals involved in the development, manufacture, testing, distribution, administration, and use of such countermeasures. In other words, the PrEP Act declaration is specifically for the purpose of providing immunity from liability, and it is different from all other emergency declarations. So this is when we need uh, groups to go out and create these therapeutics on an emergency basis, that there's a public health emergency that's you know declared. Um, we need to shield those same entities, just like we did in 1986, under a traditional long running model. They're not going to make them if we don't, if they have the liability for them. So we need to entice these people to make this for us. And we can't commercially, it wouldn't be commercially viable if we don't protect and shield them from liability because they're going to bypass all this testing that they would normally go through when it's an EUA. And so this PREP Act pulls in the uh, liability protections. The thing I thought was really interesting, I grabbed this, um, is you actually can go and find the in current existing PREP Act declarations, what's covered by, so if there's any therapeutics that are developed by, uh, you know, groups that fall into this list, they are now shielded from liability. So what I've noticed is that everything that is a PC, um, a public health emergency of international concern, which we'll get to when we get to the international stuff, it gets added. Like it just immediately gets added. So you have smallpox, uh, monkeypox, orthopox, Marburg, Marburg virus, Ebola, nerve agents, Zika, pandemic influenza, which would be like a, what we've experienced, anthrax. And then I just expanded this one because this was a new updated one, acute radiation syndrome, um, um, medical countermeasures updated January of this year, and then um, botulin toxin. So these are existing PrEP acts, and if any therapeutics come out related to these, they are all been already declared as covered. Um, this is the other transactions authority, and this was uh, something that actually got brought to the lexicon, and we will have the actual court documents, court records, filings in the um in the actual links that we're providing for this podcast. But there was a whistleblower and in the law, we call this a, a key Tom uh, relator. So basically um, this Brooke Jackson, um, who had 20 years of clinical ex trial experience for pharmaceutical and biological um, interventions was working for a contractor of um, the main vaccine producer of 2020. And you can see that basically um, in response to her false claims act. So she she had been in, you know, testing of of, of medical protocols and and 
therapeutics for 20 years. She was a part of a subcontractor to Pfizer's work. Uh, this is all public record. Um, and she documented that, that they, the clinical trials were, were failing traditional medical protocols. And specifically, um, she named how they unblinded the study after a short amount of time, which is a, a complete no-no. And so she felt that uh, they, as a contractor, a subcontractor, were, were not completing the correct information and, and basically were not were not completing and being completing the due diligence that was required under the law that she had been used to for 20 years. And she filed this False Claims Act. The, the federal judge did, to, did rule that she could continue. And the response from Pfizer was basically that they did not have to follow traditional FDA um, testing because they were contracted through the Department of Defense uh, under their OTA other transactions authorization, which um, is basically our other transaction agreement, which is basically the ability to develop um, prototypes for the, the defense uh, department that are outside the scope of traditional medical testing. In other words, they basically argued they were not required to follow the normal medical testing protocols through the way this contract was executed. It was not a traditional biological uh, contract to execute with certain medical grade testing. That was quite alarming, but what is more alarming is that the federal government filed a, um, a motion in support of that argument in October of last year. So we're just talking about in the last quarter of last year, the federal government agreed and signed on to that argument, basically stating that the ability to uh, come up with this therapeutic under this, this mechanism that happened in 2020 and 2021 did not follow those protocols. It was authorized outside of uh, traditional medical um, testing protocols. So, we are going now to uh, the same thing that we've been talking about, and we're looking here at this OTA authorization. This is 10 USC 4022, and it is the authorization or the authority of the Department of Defense to carry out certain prototype projects. And this is what I really want you to see that, um, you know, you can you can carry out and it is subject subject to sec, paragraph two the de director of the defense advanced research projects agency which is darpa for short defense advanced research projects agency darpa for short the secretary of a military department or any other official designated by the secretary of defense may under the authority of section 4021 of this title carry out prototype projects that are directly relevant to enhancing the mission effectiveness of military personnel and the supporting platform system components or materials proposed to be Required or developed by the Department of Defense or to improve of platform systems, components, or, or materials in the use by the armed forces. The authority of this section may be exercised for a transaction of a prototype project and all of the follow up and pursuant follow up. So, this basically is exactly the legal argument that Pfizer has put forth in this False Claims Act that is in federal court right now in the East, uh, Eastern Dist District of Texas. And the United States government has agreed that this particular law is implicated in what happened in 2020. So uh, the relator, uh, we call a whistleblower in a Ketam legal action, uh, Brooke Jackson, is is exactly what we're talking about here that this just came out. And then we have this 42 uh, CFR, which is uh, the basically the, the federal register, federal regulation 70.6. This is the apprehension of detention of persons with quarantinable communicable diseases. So this is uh, the director may authorize apprehension, medical examination, quarantine, isolation, or conditional release of any individual for the purpose of preventing the introduction, transmission, and spread of quarantinable communicable diseases as specified by executive order based on a finding that the individual, and there's, there's two conditions, either the individual is reasonably believed to be infected with a, so you don't even have to confirm they are. It says the individual is reasonably believed to be infected with a quarantinable, concommunicable disease in a qualifying stage and is moving to or about to move from a state to another state. So you see where the federal government has to be very careful. They can't just come in and tell the state 
states that they can take control of their citizens. It's it always has to do with the stream of interstate commerce. And so you can see that they're saying if this person has got this disease and they're moving or about to move, not exactly sure you would know how they're about to move unless they were about to get on a plane or something. But otherwise, I would think checkpoints uh, in between states. I, I'm not exactly sure how they're going to identify people that are moving, but I would think interstate travel of any kind would be uh, applicable there. Or the individual is reasonably believed to be infected with a quarantinable communicable disease in a qualifying stage and constitutes a probable source of infection to other individuals who may be moving from state to another state. Now, this is the problem because now you don't have an individual who's moving state to state. You just have an individual who is believed not confirmed, believed to be uh, in, uh, infected, and they're um, a probable source of infection to other individuals who may be moving. So basically, this is carte blanche, right? Uh, we, we, we were trying to keep it interstate commerce, but then we came down here and we said, we, if we believe someone to be affected with a quarantinable um disease and they are a probable source of infection to other people who may be moving. So they don't even have to be moving. It doesn't even have to be them. It just has to be that they are interacting with people that could be moving. Well, that is everybody. We are all potentially in society talking and dealing with people at any time that are potentially being traveling interstate in our 50 states. Um, the director will arrange for adequate food, water, appropriate accommodation, appropriate medical treatment, necessary communication measures are apprehended and held in quarantine or isolation under this part. So this is the ability for the United States federal government to quarantine, isolate people under the Health Services Act. Um, and these uh, communicable diseases are authorized by executive order. So what executive orders have come up under this in 2003? SARS, 2005 Insulinda, and Influenza, sorry. Uh, 2014. So those were both uh, Bush. 2014 was uh, asymptomatic SARS, meaning you don't even now have to even have any any actual symptoms. Asymptomatic means you have no symptoms of a, a severe acute respiratory um, syndrome. Um, and then in 2021, Biden added added measles. So I just need people to understand the degree of authority that the federal government has when there is a public health emergency. Um, it is really unfettered. There, there are no parameters. You can be reasonably be suspected. You don't even have to be confirmed and you can be reasonably, ex you know, expected to be interacting with people that are traveling. That's the broadest thing. You might as well just say anybody, anytime, anywhere. That's it. I'm going to move to global now and go through the uh, global, uh, implications of what's happened. And I'm going to have to probably again, uh, move move my, um, my, my image. But I want to talk about, this is really um, the international health regulations um, with the, you know, the World Health Organization, which is really in consolidation with the United Nations. And um, the World Health Organizations really had a uh, update. They've been updated multiple times, uh, but they were updated in 2005. And um, they were updated in 2005 to really push back to uh, individual nation states, 196 countries that all agreed to basically, you can see IHR requires that all countries have the ability to detect, assess, report, and respond to public health events. So. Um, what they've done with and since the pandemic of 2020 is they have um, basically framed up the public health emergency of international concern, P-H-E-I-C. And when the uh, secretary of the WHO declares a public health emergency of international concern, that sets into a legal framework what is supposed to happen at the country level state for analysis, tracking, isolation, and all of this data has to be tracked at the individual uh, nation state level and then reported back to the World Health Organization. And this was a voluntarily uh, uh, granted uh, international regulation that all 196 countries, including the United States, has agreed to. Let's go through and I want to give you some data and it says one of the most important aspects of IHR 2005 is the requirement that countries detect and report events that may constitute a public, a potential public health emergency of international concern, PHEIC. Under 2005 IHR, a PHEIC is declared by the World Health Organization if a situation meets two of the four criteria. 
criteria. Is public is the public health impact of the event serious? Is the event unusual, unexpected? Is there a significant risk of international spread? Is there a significant risk of international travel or trade restrictions? And so this is how they've now monitor uh, they've militarized healthcare because they basically said any kind of public health emergency of international concern has global uh, in international economic implications, just like coronavirus did in 2020. And so therefore, if there is a significant risk of spread, and that's, you know, if you look at the World Health Organization, they'll tell you that a disease can spread from a remote village in Africa, you know, so the sub-Saharan Africa to, you know, be a global thing within 36 hours. So pretty much there's always a risk of international spread. I don't care where you are in the world. And then is there a significant risk of international travel or trade restrictions? And this is where they bring and will this have an economic impact on international commerce? And of course, they feel that all of it would. They also list explicitly SARS, human influenza caused by a new subtype. So that's your coronavirus. You, you have your smallpox and other notable events, cholera, cho cho cholera I don't even, I can't pronounce some of these medical terminals, uh, pneumonia basically pneumonic plague, yellow fever, uh, viral hemorrhagic fever, West Nile. There's all of these things. And then it says other biological, radiological, or chemical events that meet IHR criteria. And since IHR was put into place, the WHO has declared the following uh, public health uh, emer you know, emergencies of international concern, and that is H1N1, polio, Ebola, Zika, COVID-19, and monkeypox. So you can start to see the framework internationally that we have basically morphed into a data tracking um, and analytical framework to send information to the WHO. Now, the Affordable Care Act in 2010 under Obama um, actually really was bringing in a lot of this international classification of diseases. So the ICD uh, codes basically were created in 1893. And so we've tracked these, these international or these diseases internationally since that time. In 1948, the WHO took control of the clinical um, designations for the international classification of diseases. In 1955, the WHO modified the ICD-10 to track mortality. In 1977, we had been on the ninth revision of the ICD codes, which was ICD-9, and that was used all the way up until uh, 2014 when the ICD code 10 were mandated for medical coding. And just so you can understand um, what happened when that happened, they did two things uh, when we moved from ICD-9 to ICD-10. And this was all a part of Obamacare uh, mandates. Basically, they added 68,000 new additional medical codes. And then they added the requirement that the medical professional, I don't know if they follow this, but they added the requirement that medical professionals report the most specific code applicable out of the now total 155 thousand medical codes. So you can see if you're a medical coder, you should be making six figures every year because just to even understand all 155,000 codes seems crazy with the requirement that it gets tracked at the most granular level possible. So um, basically, in 1988, America passed the Medicare Catastrophic Coverage Act, which gave us and pushed us to go along with with um, the international rules, regulations, and coding. And obviously, um, the Obamacare Act is, is how we actually moved to ICD-10. But the point I want you to understand is between um, ICD-10 and 2005 international health regulations, we are required as a nation state of the World Health Organization to track these things at the most granular level and report them to the World Health Organization. So that obviously brought medical uh, tracking and analysis uh, a lot up to the global level for the World Health Organization. But what's happening right now is a new amendment, mostly written by the Biden administration. And I've talked about this on this podcast of uh, the amendments that are actually being met with right now as we speak, their second uh, meeting to discuss passing the new amendments to the IHRs. Uh, this is a Brownstone Institute 
huge um, um, clip of what is happening with these major amendments. And I would just, I'm going to read it, but I would just summarize by telling you that basically it is outsourcing the national sovereignty to deal with health crises in your own individualized country specific way to the World Health Organization. And this is a legally binding agreement. In other words, the World Health Organization will assess uh, public health emergencies of international concern, decide how the right protocols are to be, will push those down to the nation states, and the nation states have agreed under the terms of the new IHRs to follow those protocols without um, ability to modify them. So the Brownstone Institute, the amendments to the IHR are intended to fundamentally change the relationship between individuals, their country governments, and the World Health Organization, the WHO. They place the WHO as having rights overriding that of individuals, erasing the basic principles developed after World War II regarding human rights and the sovereignty of states. In doing so, they signal a return to a colonial feudal approach fundamentally different to that which people uh, in relatively demo democratic countries have been accustomed. They la the lack of major pushback by not only politicians, but the lack of concern in the media and consequent ignorance of the general public that this is happening is actually strange and alarming. Aspects of the amendments involving the largest changes of the workings of society and international regulations are discussed below. Following this are annotated extracts from the World Health uh, Organization's document that's provided on the WHO website is currently in the process. Like I said, they are literally meeting their second meeting is happening as we speak right now uh, regarding exactly getting these uh, regulations passed. Uh, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights agreed by the United Nations after the aftermath of World War II and in the context of much of the world emerging from a colonial yoke is predicated on the concept that all humans are born with equal and inalienable rights given gained by the simple fact that they are born. In 1948, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights was intended to codify these to prevent a return to inequality and totalitarian rule. So this is huge. This is the final globalization of healthcare, and it is not being covered because um, there is a global consortium of the monetization and weaponization of healthcare at the international level. And the rules and the regulations that I've gone through, that I've taken you through in the United States, really uh, show the legal framework in America and how it's been set up in America. So I'm going to go back to, to uh, not, me not being on this again and let, let you see kind of some of the final conclusions of what we have gone through. So let's sum it up. The United States went through... Um, a complete conversion militarily um, between, you know, our individual liberties under the Patriot Act, uh, the legal standards of scrutiny for people that changed under the Patriot Act with their national security letters, with your cell phone records, your bank accounts, all of these things I've discussed before. But in tandem to that, and at the same time, was uh, a massive amount of public health laws that gave uh, both the Department of Defense and the Department of Human Health and Human Services the extra powers in the case of either wartime or public health emergencies to bypass um, standard medical protocols of releasing uh, biological, chemical, radiological, and neurological um, agents, weapons, or products onto uh, the general human population. Um, the EUA ends e efficacy requirements, and we're going to look at that. Within the framework of CBRN elements, defensive um, Medical countermeasures end the need for safety testing as all government contractors can be contracted to develop prototypes. This is an argument that the federal government is making right now in federal court in East Texas. Um, it has nullified the requirement to get informed consent. It is not required. You do not have to give informed consent to take a completely experimental biological agent. And it also established, all of these laws established similar to the Vaccine Injury Compensation Fund that was established in 1986. It established uh, and routed all inner, inner <laughs> injury claims to the Countermeasures Injury Compensation Program. So in other words, we had to have this in 1986 to get these manufacturers to develop these therapies that we need for our children. And likewise, we now have this fund that says, hey, if you're injured, you don't get to go to civil court 
and sue. No, no, no. You're going to be routed to a countermeasures injury compensation fund. And this is why you're not going to be able to uh, go to court over these things. The other thing that all of these laws really did is they put a lot of guidance documents out to state, local governments, um, municipalities, you know, um, to, to let them know that um, the federal government was in charge during public health emergencies and that they actually preempt um, basically state law, which which really is a problem. And that is the, in fact, problem. Wyoming, right now, their legislature is in the midst of discussing passing laws that will basically nullify the uh, legal authority and reach of the WHO and also uh, the federal government in the area of health. And this makes sense because we are what we call a republic and we have the 10th Amendment. The 10th Amendment says that anything that is not really police powers are reserved specifically to the federal government, which healthcare was not, if it was not specifically reserved to the federal government, it under the constitution belongs to the states. And this is exactly what the states need to do to fight back against this massive, we can just do whatever we want. There's no liability anywhere. We don't have to follow medical testing protocols that you're used to. We don't have to give you informed consent. We don't have to even like tell you what we're doing. And by the way, state, we can come in and quarantine these people uh, even if we suspect that they have these things because that is our authority under the new militarization of healthcare in the world. And there's nothing that you can do to take us to court uh, except for this. You can go to this. That is completely not true. At the end of the day, the Constitution is the defining document along with its amendments. And we have states rights. We are a republic and we do have federalism in this country. And that is if states will actually take their authority back and do something with it, then we could we could see uh, you know, some changes here. So I finally got my answer to my question of how can I resolve informed consent required with EUA when it clearly wasn't being delivered. And this is basically 21 U.S. Code 360 BBB3, Authorization for Medical Products for Use in Emergencies. And it basically talks about how the Public Health Services Act, you know, you can produce and put these things, these these agents into the stream of commerce, even if um, basically, and it says right here, approval status of these products, section two, an authorization under paragraph one may authorize an emergency use of a product that A, is not approved, licensed, or cleared for commercial distribution under sections 350. 360, 360B, 360E of the Public Health Service Act. In other words, it has not gone through the traditional medical approval protocol process, and that is fine. You, you do not have to go through. And so we know that EUA ends uh, the medical protocols that we're used to. But then we have 21 CFR. This is our federal regulation. This is not a statute, but this is what has been written as a federal regulation from the statute. And you can see 21 CFR 50.24, exemption from informed consent requirements for emergency research. And basically this is saying that the IRB responsible for your approval and continue review of clinical investigation described in this section may approve that investigation without requiring that informed consent of all research subjects to be obtained if the IRB, with the concurrence of the licensed physician who is a member of the consultant of the IRB and who is not participating, finds and documents the following. One, the human subjects are in a life-threatening situation. Available treatments are unproven or unsatisfactory, and the collection of valid scientific data, which may include evidence obtained through randomized placebo-controlled investigations, is necessary to determine the safety and effectiveness of particular interventions. In other words, that the subjects are in a life-threatening situation, and we don't have enough proven medical collected data, and it, we don't have uh, a, the, basically a, an actual investigation to determine the safety and efficacy of these things. Uh, two, informing and obtaining informed consent is not feasible because one or I, the subjects will be will not be able to give their informed consent as a result of their medical condition or I, I, the invention under investigation must be administered before consent of the subjects legally authorized representatives feasible or I, 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 there is no reasonable way to identify prospectively the individuals likely to be eligible or to participate in clinical uh, investigations. Basically, they 
it have exempted out uh, informed consent. And so we step back and look at our final Etch-a-Sketch and we see that we have a global central bank that interacts with all the central banks of all the countries and specifically the Federal Reserve that are moving us to central bank digital currencies, which is a complete voucher controlled monetary system. We see that through um, the various acts, um, both the Department of Defense and the Department of Health and Human Services has been authorized to create prototypes, to execute biologics into the stream of commerce, even absent the normal standard medical protocol testing and even absent informed consent. And we see now that the World Health Organization is in the middle of promulgating um, this last revision that we've had to IHR since 1970, uh, no, 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 not, not 2005, 1977 was the uh, ICM codes, um, ICD codes. So we see finally that we are looking at the transferring of sovereignty over, over national health emergencies to the global authority of the World Health Organization. And if these regulations pass, that is exactly what we'll have. And then it could be even worse than our current framework and situation, which I think is abysmally horrible for, for human life. But it would be worse because then you'd have U.S. politicians saying, we didn't, you can't do anything about it. It's the who, and we have to do it because we're in this stream of interstate commerce and we're the most you know important country in the world with the global currency reserve. So we have to do these medical uh, countermeasures. And, and that brings in a whole nother uh, realm of legal protections that that really there's no, they're the only group that's not protected is the human individual on this framework. And so I will just conclude by stating that um, humanity, humanity must must, must, must. We must fight. We must do these podcasts. We must send these things to our friends and our family so that people can understand what has happened since 9-11 and how uh, everything is lined up now to really put us into a total box of totalitarian control, both not only domestically in the United States, but internationally and globally. We must pursue liberty and freedom, whatever the cost, always. I hope that you guys share this information far and wide. It will be available in multiple channels if it's not continuing to be available where we expect it to be. So please disseminate because I have done my absolute best to synthesize a lot of information in a very uh, digestible way so that you can feel confident that um, we are at a precipice. We are at the precipice of humanity. Take care, everybody.